All right, uh, I'm Mark. Uh, good to have you guys here at Bayside. If you have a Bible, Romans chapter five is where we are today. Um, and let's jump into this. So Romans chapter five, one writer has said, if we're on a journey and we're going toward this t- mountaintop, Romans 5, the first five verses, which is what we're going to hit today, really kind of gives us a real snapshot of what it's going to look like at the peak. And then we come back down into the valley and we keep kind of trudging. Because what it does, it g- gives us a snapshot and answers a massive question, which is kind of, why are you here? Why are you, what is your purpose? What is your meaning in life? What is, you know, when you go into like a bookstore or whatever, what oftentimes happens is you'll go in and you'll go to the self-help section or whatever, and they're constantly trying to help you to improve your life. But one of the problems with those books and those philosophies is it hasn't defined what a win is. It hasn't told you this is actually what it means to win at life. This is the purpose of life. This is the meaning of life. And one of the things that Paul brings up in this text is um, here's what life is really about. This is why you wake up in the morning. This is what you're trying to get out of life. And I'm going to tell you how to actually get it versus some of the ways that you try to get it. So that's what we're going to jump into. Romans chapter 1, verse 5. Oh, here we go. (laughs) Um, okay, uh, verse, chapter five, verse one, goes like this. Therefore, since we've been justified, so this is a word we talked about last week, Ray talked about, through faith, justification by faith, of course, this idea that changed the world, Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, this thing created Western civilization because the Catholic Church had kind of been running in a way where you could pay for your friends to get out of hell, you could give them certain Hail Marys, and that's what would justify you in front of God, and Then Martin Luther, these guys read Romans and they got to chapter five and it's like, no, no, wait, you're actually justified by faith in Jesus, not by your works. And so some of you, that's what, that's the sermon. That's all you need to hear right now. Just that alone can change your life. Because some of you have been coming to church your whole life and you've been told that doing good things, not swearing, not, you know, or maybe you say Christian swear words like, oh, thing mod. And you go, therefore I'm a good person. I don't watch rated R movies. I go to church my whole life. I I never even kissed until my honeymoon, which is weird. (laughs) If you can wait till your honeymoon not to kiss, you probably shouldn't be getting married like because you're probably not that attracted to her. (laughs) Okay, so some of you, you legitimately think that like, If you do those things and you don't do those things, that that means God's going to love you and let you come to heaven. And you've forgotten the fact that, no, 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 that's not actually how you get saved at all. It's actually justified by faith, which is short short term for Jesus. What Jesus has done in the cross and the resurrection, that it's not by your performance for God, but it's by his performance for you. In the death and the resurrection of Jesus, taking on the wrath of God, dying for your sin, rising again for your salvation. And so this word justified, it's like to be in the law court of God and you get a declaration that you are vindicated, you are righteous, you are justified, you are innocent. Or as uh, Kurt and I were talking about the other day, he, he, said, he gave me this term, just as if I never sinned. He told you I had to tell you that he told me that phrase. <laughs> Everything's always a competition. Uh, Just as if I never sinned. That's what you're looking for in the law court of God. How does that happen? Not by being a good person, but because Jesus was good for you. Not by doing pilgrimages. Not by doing certain amount of things. It's by Jesus' work for you and you alone, which sets you free and gives you identity. That's what all of last week was about too in chapter four. And then Paul says this, which is kind of why we wake up in the morning right here. We have peace. What's the thing You try to go after, every part of your life is about trying to find this right here, peace, right? It's the reason you go, you try to be more beautiful, have more money, have more, you know, sex, try to have different partners, have this at your job. All of it is to find peace, right? To find like, I'm fulfilled, I have value, I have identity, I have meaning and purpose and pleasure in my life. This is ultimately what you're seeking is peace. And Paul's going to tell us where to get it. So the first thing is he says, here's the beautiful part. You have peace with who? God. See, this is an important part because we oftentimes think about peace. We think like socially, uh, okay, I have peace with people. I have peace in relationships. I have peace in my heart or whatever. And he goes, no, no, guys, I know that this might bore you, but actually the most important thing is that you have peace with God. Like, I know we just go, oh, peace with God. Lord. 
Because what we're told is, hey, this is why you should be a believer. You should be a believer because you get to go to heaven when you die. You should be a believer because you get your sins forgiven. You should be a believer because all these things. And we forget that the greatest treasure in the universe is God. It is literally like my life's, all I think about when I wake up in the morning is how can I try to make God beautiful and interesting to you? Because if you miss that, you miss the greatest treasure on the planet. And I'm not talking about the stuff you get from him, just him, him alone. Like, does he excite you? Is he the ultimate treasure to you? Or is it just like, yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to the, you know, the other things. Here's what uh, First Peter says, First Peter chapter three, verse 18, one of my favorite verses says this, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. And then he says this, what's the point? That he might bring us to God. That's why he died. Not so that you could, you know, f- fly around in heaven one day and have all the food that you like, all these things that we come up with, like woo people in, like, hey, if you believe in Jesus, get on his team and you're going to get all, you're going to see grandma again. How about you get God? And that, like that right there should just be like, ah! But we're like, moving on, what else? So here's what John Piper says. The gospel is not a way to get people to heaven. It's a way to get people to God. It's a way of overcoming every obstacle to everlasting joy in God, which is what he's after, your joy, your pleasure, your delight forevermore, as the Psalms say. If we don't want God above all things, We've not been converted by the gospel. If you, have, if you could have heaven with no sickness, with all the friends you ever had on earth, all the food you ever liked, all the leisure activities you ever enjoyed, all the natural beauties you ever saw and the physical pleasures that you ever tasted and no human conflict, no natural disasters, could you be satisfied with heaven even if God was not there? Come on, that's mic drop. End of story. Some of you could. It's like, ah, see Tony again. We fly around a little bit. We get to eat some steak. Sounds like a dream. Oh, God's not there. (laughs) Here's what happens. The prosperity gospel comes along and tells us, you become a Christian, you're going to have a great marriage. You become a Christian, God's going to give you money. You become a Christian, God's going to make you healthy, wealthy, wise. And in that moment, why did you believe? Because you elevated gift above giver. You cared more about the blessings of God than actually just knowing him. That's the problem. So Paul starts and he goes, here's what you get peace with. First, you get it with God. Should be end of sermon. Good night, Father. But there's other stuff we have peace with. Because we all have this internal thing that we want internal peace. We want life to settle. We have anxiety. We're fearful. And so we go after the beauty. We go after the success. We go after the things in our life that we think will actually give us joy and peace. And then what happens is we're driven to perfection. And when we fail, When those things fail to give us peace, we get fearful and we're like, well, we can't, because here's what we try to do. We try to find peace with ourselves by what? Getting more money, getting a better job, redoing the kitchen, getting another boat, making some new friends. We go after all these things. But the problem is you're never gonna, like some of you try to get justified or get peace with God by being a good uh, husband, right? How's that going for you? Right? I remember the first, first, uh, Aaron and I have been together 25 years. We dated for five, which again, I do not suggest. Uh, and <sighs> I kissed dating goodbye. <laughs> uh, so, so we dated for five. We, we were married for, we've been together 25 years. So, but here's what she said in the early days uh, when, we were, when we were married. Uh, we didn't have any money. She would say like, Valentine's Day doesn't matter. And I believed her, right? Like that's, So I was, uh, yeah, Valentine's Day doesn't matter, you know, and then Valentine's Day would come and it mattered, (laughs) right? And some of you young guys were like, no, man, it doesn't matter. We don't have any money. She just loves me. No, she doesn't. (laughs) She doesn't. She wants Valentine's Day, no matter what she says. 
Don't worry, we don't have to go out for dinner. Yes, yes, you do. <laughs> the problem is it took me 10 years. 10 years to figure that out. If I was banking on being a good husband to actually justify me and give me peace, I'd be in a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble. Some of you, you're hoping to be a good parent and that's what's gonna give you peace. You're gonna be a good mom, you're gonna be a good dad. How's that going for you? You ever looked at your kids? Psychopaths, half of them. And how's the parenting going? You try to do all the tips, you try to do all the good things. Listen, uh, so one of my favorite movies in the world is, I'm a big movie guy, I like to show my kids movies and so they have the experience. So I, I show them Jurassic Park, you know, er, as early as I can. But I made a mistake with my youngest, she was seven, and I showed her Jurassic Park um, and, and I filmed actually, I'm gonna show you the film of uh, me, how she reacted. Yeah, that's good parenting right there. That's what that is. It's like just weekly apologies at this point. See, if we look to parent, <laughs> some of you are like, is that for real? Yeah, that's for real. She's fine now. She's fine now. Took a couple of years. Um, but that's parenting, man. That's like us trying to be good parents, us trying to be good husbands, us trying to be good dads. I speak at men's conferences all the time and I get to talk to guys about the, the identity that we have. Like, can I, you know, and there was this movie that I watched years ago with Ted Danson and they asked him why he was a workaholic. Why was he never home? You ever feel that tension as guys, as men? You know, oh, and he said, well, the reason I wasn't home is because I thought a man was supposed to provide for his family. I thought I was supposed to be out providing, so I worked hard, tried to provide... And then he stopped and he goes, no, actually, that's not why. It's because when I'm at work, I'm somebody. I'm, I'm, I'm respected, I'm the man, and then I come home and I feel lost. That's what he said. And that's my, like, guys, I got three daughters, which means I got four mothers and a female dog. Listen, I got, I got, uh, I mean, I planted a church 12 years ago with nobody. I, I'm the boss. I have 100 employees. At work, I'm the man. Right? I just, I just say stuff and it happens. Hey, we're supposed to do this. And 100 people go and figure it out. It's like, boom. And then I get home. And it's just like, you really, you know Wednesday's garbage day, you idiot. And all of a sudden, I don't even know who I am anymore. Do you know how many times my wife has said, you know I don't work for you, right? <laughs> I'm just like, I know it would be easier if you did though. <laughs> Our marriage would be much better. How many of us are looking to being a good dad, being a good husband, being a good employee, being a good boss, being a good girlfriend, being a good grandma to find this. And you're not getting it because you're looking at the wrong place. You're looking to circumstances. You're looking to your life. You're looking to your money. You're looking to your bank account. Here's what Jesus says. John 16, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Who has overcome the world? Not your circumstances. Guys, you look to your money to save you and give you peace. What happens when it disappears? You're looking to your beauty to save you and give you peace. Guys, hate to tell you, it goes away, right? You age, man. And I know some of you are doing everything in your power to make sure that doesn't happen, but we can tell. You're always smiling. <laughs> we all know. You're trusting to the wrong stuff. You are either gonna trust to Christ or circumstances in your life. And this one will fail you. Money will fail you. People will fail you. Yourself will fail you. 
And what he says is, if you have me, you have peace in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of anxiety, when the world goes chaotic. Who, we're like, it's like, a, I don't love flying, but when I fly and there's turbulence, where do you think I look when there's turbulence? Flight attendant, thank you. One lady said, God. I'm like, no, I'm not that spiritual, right? <laughs> Clearly you're more spiritual than me. You look at the flight attendant, man, because if the plane is shaking and the flight attendant is just pouring coffee, hanging out, talking, everything's fine. It's like, oh, you want decaf? Well, yeah, we're fine. <laughs> she's fine. But if she's on the phone going, what, what was that, Tom? I don't know what's going on. <laughs> then you're going to freak out, right? You'll be like, oh my gosh, we're all dead. Look at her, she's freaking out. So when the world is going through tribulation and anxiety over the last two years, how's the church been doing? Jesus just said, you're gonna have peace. You're supposed to be the people that are calm in the midst of the storm. And look at how we've been, freaking out. I read your social media, oh, the QR codes, everyone's gonna die. We're all gonna die, ah, run. You think the Christians are the one that's supposed to be running around freaking out frantic? No, we're supposed to be chill, calm, pour the coffee. We're all going down. You want decaf? <laughs> like, guys, if Jesus Christ gives you peace, what is the church supposed to be for the world? Peace, calm, chill, right? So this is what he gives us because he's overcome the world. Some of you, you're trying to solve the anxiety in your life by looking to yourself or your circumstances versus him. Your theology is the thing that needs to change. Your doctrine actually needs to change because you will recognize, see, here's where the anxiety comes in your life. It's because you really believe deep down that you're in control. See, but if you realize you weren't in control and he is, now the peace comes, right? Because, like, okay, so, so those of you who know me a bit, see me speak a bit, you see the ticks I do with my face. I got Tourette's syndrome. I got obsessive compulsive disorder. Those of you who are new are like, what's been going on for the last 20 minutes? Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, <laughs> I have these ticks and, you know, I had these like, uh, these habits growing up with Tourette's where I would like, you know, I've shared this with some of you guys, but like I would swear randomly. Like I had this habit where I would just say, like I'd go to the bus stop, I'd just say F, F, F bombs. Like I would drop F bombs in my life randomly. There's F, right? Not the letter F, like the word F, right? <laughs> and, uh, and like, I, and that was my life. Like growing up, that's a way not to be cool in junior high, right? F, what the? <laughs> like that was my life. And the one job you're never going to get when you throw F-bombs around at people is a preacher. Because like, hey, welcome to Bayside. Join an F community group. <laughs> it's not going to work. So, but with God, as we sung earlier, nothing is impossible. But you know, one of, my, one of my OCD things growing up was I'd have to hit a table a certain amount of times so that a bad thing wouldn't happen. That was in my head. You know, someone would say the word cancer and I'd like hit the table, but then I'd have to hit it four or five times so that cancer wouldn't happen in someone's life. And you know what changed it for me was I started to understand that I am not in control of the world and he is. And tapping a table ain't gonna do anything. It was my theology and my doctrine that needed to change for me to have peace, right? This is what he's talking about. You have peace with God, you have inner peace, we collapse under the pressure of having too much authority in our life, right? We collapse under the pressure. As what happens is this is why there's so much dysphoria in regard to sexuality, gender, identity today versus other times because we're at a place where we're being told not that science is the thing that matters, not that philosophy, not that art, but that psychology is the primary thing. That's the thing, psychology. Your inward self is now the ultimate authority. And so if your inward self is the ultimate authority, here's the problem. You don't trust your inward self. It's not a great telltale sign because you're like, I don't really trust myself as an authority. So here's what Carl Truman says. He says, if the inner psychological life 
of the individual is sovereign and most important, then identity becomes as potentially unlimited as the human imagination, which then creates a problem because you're like, I don't know what to do. Like it's, it's, there's too many things I could be and it crushes you. It's called the paralysis of choice. Remember when you used to go to the grocery store and there was one kind of tomato sauce and now there's 60 and you're not sure what to do. That's the paralysis of choice. Dating. A hundred years ago, you want to know what girl you chose? One of the 12 girls in your village that wasn't your sister. That was it. (laughs) Those were your options. Now you got 3 billion girls you could choose. And you're just on the app and you're looking and you're totally paralyzed because you've been given too much authority. This is why today, suffering, evil, people come up and they say, I'm a skeptic. Too much suffering is evil. There's no God. You know, in the ancients, 7,000 years of philosophy, they never deduced that. What they deduced was we don't understand what the gods are doing. We're too limited in our knowledge. We don't know stuff. Today, we don't think that. We think that we're gods. And we should be able to figure out what's going on. Ergo, if we can't, there must not be a God. That's the problem with having too much authority and it kills us every day. And I, can I tell you something? Some of you, I need to give this verse to because maybe this is the one thing you need to hear because you've been given so much authority that you feel the pressure in life. And let me just say this. You're looking around at people, they got 70 million Instagram followers and you got 70 and you're feeling like, why am I taking a nap right now? I should be producing. That's the kind of world that will crush you. You will never have peace because there's always something more to accomplish. Some of you, and I used to actually think that that was like, you need to go after. I used to talk to my church all the time. You better go after. You better sell everything you got. You're lazy. You're sitting around here. You're, la- you're not even giving. You're cheap. You got to sell everything. You got to, and you know, that's coming at some point. But, <laughs> but, but I used to say it over and over and over. And, and, then, and then it dawned on me. I read this text and some of you, listen, you need to just hear this text because this is maybe what you are wrestling with right now, 1 Thessalonians 4.11, hit me. Changed my whole perspective. It said this, make it your ambition to lead a quiet and simple life. Hello. Some of you are not gonna change the world, man. And I gotta stop talking to you like you will because there's a difference between leadership and discipleship and some of you are not leaders. You're not gonna create global mission organizations that are gonna change the world. You are gonna go to the grocery store for the glory of God and that's it. And let me tell you something, that's okay. That's how you find peace. You begin to recognize that God has built you for that. Now, what does this peace come through? It comes through our Lord Jesus, not through the world, not through life. And here's the thing about this phrase here. He's saying the peace comes through Jesus. Okay, so oftentimes what we do with that is we say, um, Okay, the peace comes through Jesus. That must mean when I kind of raise my hand or I made a decision for Christ, that means now the peace comes through that. That's not, you know, that's beautiful, of course, the life, death, resurrection of Jesus. But you know, the book of Hebrews talks about the fact that Jesus has an ongoing ministry right now where he is in heaven actually praying for you right now, interceding on your behalf right now. Isn't that beautiful? Like, Like, guys, that means when your prayer life sucks, He's sitting praying for you. Because what we need isn't just, okay, God forgave me of my past sins. We actually need ongoing forgiveness, right? The stuff you did yesterday, the stuff you're doing right now in this room, the stuff you're gonna do tomorrow, you need the ongoing application of the atonement to your life. Like, some of you are like, okay, but we'll mark you're a pastor. You know, listen. I went to an Apple store recently. I walked in. I was already jacked up mad. I had my phone out. I had to change something. I'm like, walk up to the guy behind the counter. I'm like, hey, I need to change this about my phone. He looks at my phone. He's like, you can't change it. I said, of course you can change it. I need to talk to the manager. Try, okay, talk to the manager. I said, you got to change it. We can't change it, sir. We got to do we, we, you have your, your records. I'm like, what are you talking about the records? I want to talk to another manager. Is Steve Jobs here? I need to talk to somebody. My phone got this, my phone, you gotta do this. What are you talking about? And I was mad. I was like, come on, I want to talk to somebody. Do something. Finally, the guy goes, look, I'm sorry, Pastor Mark. Bro, why didn't you lead with that? This whole exchange would be vastly different. 
Right? Be like, I, I don't even like possessions. Take the phone. I shall be fine. <laughs> like, this is who we are. Listen, my wife, wonderful lady. Man, she needs help, though. <laughs> she was at a women's event uh, this week, chatting with some ladies, and they were talking, how, how are you guys like being out of California, better in the rain? Your husband, does he, you know, does he like tanning? And my wife goes, yeah, yeah. She's like, oh, yeah, he likes tanning. By the end of the summer, he's going to look like George Foreman. And then the ladies just sat there, super awkward, like, yeah, like the grill, I don't, what do you mean? And she's like, I don't understand what's wrong with these people, like, why are they reacting like this? And they just kind of awkward, like, oh yeah, that's nice that he wants to look like, what she meant is that I'm going to look like George Hamilton. man this woman needs the grace of Christ in her life every single day ongoing not just in the past you need the grace of Jesus every single day and this is why when he says it's the Lord Jesus Christ that's going to bring it, he's going to do this ongoing work to actually do it. And then he says, verse 2, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the... Okay, what are we boasting in? What is our life about? The glory of God. Notice, it's the glory of God. This is the Greek word doxa. It means weight or girth. It's like you're, it's something with a lot of weight impacts something else and, it, it, and, it, and the, that thing feels it and it's overwhelmed by it. This is literally our job to be overwhelmed and dedicated not to the glory of ourselves, but to the glory of God. Now, this is where we get this messed up. How many of you in this room feel like God has given you good things this week, right? Hopefully all of the fact that you're sitting here right now should just be blowing your mind, all right? You have breath in your lungs, you got clothes on, you should be like, ah, this is crazy, right? God is giving, now here's the problem. Um, okay, so I was reading a while ago the difference between cat theology and dog theology, okay? The difference is this, how many in this room have dogs? Holy smokes, there's a lot of dog lovers. Love it, love those dogs. How many have cats? Right? Sorry about that. No, I'm just kidding. Love the cats, love the cats. Okay, so here's the difference between dogs and cats. You give your dog, uh, you pamper your dog, you give it food, you give it love, you give it clean up after it. It deduces my master is God, right? And so when you come home, that dog is, <laughs> right? And it's a, you could, I, I forgot my dog for a whole day, all right? It doesn't matter. Unconditional love, right? My family went out, I thought the dog was like in this little cupboard. It's like, oh, what are you doing in there? Still, <laughs> what can I do for you? I love you, I love you, <laughs> right? That's the dog. A cat though. You see, a cat deduces, this person feeds me, loves me, cleans up after me, I am God. <laughs> and so when you come home, that thing's just creeping around up on the, it thinks it's a pharaoh. Are you home now to serve me? So many of you have cat theology versus dog theology because you think the blessings in your life mean that you are God. You ain't. Constantly the Bible's telling you to live for the glory of God, not the glory of yourself. Actually, you don't even get second place. Philippians tells you you're supposed to think of others more important than yourself. You're getting third in regard to what your priority is in life. To live for the glory of God 
not for the glory of ourselves, because that's the way you were designed. You were, this isn't a narcissistic thing. This is actually the design of God so that you flourish and have joy. That's the way he built you. You know, you build things and if they run properly, they run on that thing. But if they don't, like if you design a car, I'm, I'm not a car guy. So I remember getting a car a few years ago and I was like leasing it. And after like four years, I took it in. I'm like, it doesn't even work. And they're like, when's the last time you did an oil change? I'm like, never done one. Don't even know what that is. <laughs> they're like, your car's like, <laughs> I'm like, right, fix it. There's a certain way you're supposed to run a thing when it's designed in a particular way. God has designed you to live for his glory, not your own, and your misery comes about in your life when you choose to live for yourself rather than him. That's what Paul's trying to save you from. And so he says this in the next verse. That was two verses. By the way, here's the handout. Look, <laughs> laughing. <laughs> I, I did my best here. But anyway, so this week we have lines after the verses so you can take notes. And then we got three points. Now, some of you right now, you're like, what are the three points? He's not even talking about them. Again, like I said two weeks, don't come up to me at Target and ask me what point three is. I don't care. Okay, figure it out. But I'm going to tell them to you right now. Point one, hope starts with God which is very true out of the passage, all three of these. Number two, hope transforms trouble, which I'm going to talk about. And three, if I don't get to it, hope refuses to quit. Now, that's what these next couple of verses are about. Look at these. It says in verse three, not only so, but we also glory in our suffering. So we glory in God, but we glory in suffering. And if you haven't experienced suffering in your life, just wait. Now, what does suffering do? Atheism will tell you suffering is your enemy. There's no good that can come of it. Karma will tell you suffering. You're paying back for an old life. Christianity comes along and says, no, Jesus came and suffered. He didn't stay distant. He actually entered in and suffered for you. And here's what suffering does. It actually, in the face of atheism, produces something. Right? Right there, that word right there. That's 10 minutes, but I'm running out of time. <laughs> what does suffering produce? Perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character hope. Have you been through, listen guys, uh, I know we avoid suffering at all costs, but it is probably the only thing, maybe more than pleasure, that lets us learn stuff in life, right? Like, listen, uh, I, uh, going through school with all those weird tics, you know, I used to have this habit where I would go down on the ground on my knees, I guess, when I was talking to people and just like stand up. And I lived in Toronto, so there was snow on the ground. So I'd be like outside smoking. I smoked all through high school, all through college. So I'd be outside smoking. I'd just, hey guys, what's going on? Which is, again, not a way to be cool, right? When you're walking around these wet patches, hey guys, want to hang out? <laughs> but you know, all of that produced perseverance and character in me and made me who I am today. And I actually probably wouldn't trade it for the world because I know I'm weird, but so are you. Look at you guys. <laughs> Look at you. But that's the point. This church is not a country club. It's a hospital for broken messed up people depending on the grace of Jesus. And if you came to this church looking for the perfect church, leave now because you just ruined it. Because <laughs> you are sinful and have suffered. And it's a totally different philosophy that says the suffering in my life has actually produced character in me versus ruining my life versus destroying me. That's what Jesus can do. And then verse five, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts. I actually think this is not the best translation of this. I think, uh, I won't get into the technical reality. I, I actually think this is our love for God has been poured, poured out. Because at the end of the day, listen, 
I'll end with this. Um, we could sit in this room and I could argue with you about the life and the death and resurrection of Jesus and why it makes sense historically. And every single one of you could stand up and say, I believe it. But here's the problem. Satan believes all that too, and it doesn't save him. Why? Because he doesn't love it. He doesn't treasure it above everything else in the universe. Some of you have believed some stuff about Christianity, but you don't actually love Jesus. You just believe in him. That's not the kind of faith that saves. So through this whole series, as we keep talking about justified by faith, and into that is a faith that actually treasures Jesus above every other thing in the universe. And that's the thing God pours out into our hearts. And so let me pray to that end. Father, I pray that that's actually just true about us in this room, that we not only believe in you and have trusted in you, but that we actually love you. And there's gonna be people here who've never trusted you, never given their life to you. And I pray right now that you would speak to them. And it says by the Holy Spirit, so Holy Spirit, speak and let us hear you and be convicted and have the courage to believe in you, Jesus. Your life, your death, your resurrection in our place. That you would save us and seal us. And for those of us who know you and have known you, Lord, let us be people who move maybe from just believing to treasuring above all things. That we would live not for our own glory, but for yours. And that we would have the courage, even in this moment, if we just accepted Jesus for the first time, we just ask that you go over to the I raise my hand table and we can pray for you, love on you, get you involved in our church, which does take courage. But this is what this text is about. Where does the hope come from? Not by living from my own strength, not by believing I'm the center of all things, but really receiving that you are and you would change us and we would live for your glory and the good of people. In Jesus' great name we pray. 